seems like every week I have to talk to somebody that's walking through life with a burden on their heart that they were never intended to carry. I, I talk almost every day with people who are worn out and weary. They're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And, and, and oftentimes it's because they're carrying the burden of me, myself, and I. And so I just want you to know, I, I may get a little feisty in this message, but my, the heart of this message is this, I just want to bless you. I'm so tired of you being, as the old timers say, weary and heavy laden. I'm so tired of you being exhausted and worn out. And today, my prayer and my goal, my heart, is that you'll walk out of here with a little pep in your step. You'll walk out of here today with maybe your shoulders held back instead of slouching because you're tired. My heart, my desire, my prayer for you is that God will use today's message to set you free from unnecessary burdens. You're saying, Randy, why is that? Well, look at your sheet. It's because of this fact. The fact of the matter is this. We were not designed to handle the cares, concerns, and commitments of our lives alone. We were not designed to handle the cares, the concerns, and commitments of our lives alone. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, he says, My Father has entrusted everything to me. Underline that word, me. Now, as you look at that verse, do you see your name anywhere there? Does it say where, he, does Jesus say, my father has entrusted in Jason Keller, my father has entrusted in Susan Adelaide, my father has entrusted in you, the, the, the everything in, in life, the cares and concerns and the commitments of this life. No, God has given Jesus the responsibility of handling those things. God has given Jesus the responsibility of carrying those loads. In fact, I don't know about you, but God has put me in a position where daily I am reminded that I can't do it. Daily, when a, when a young mother comes to me overwhelmed with the responsibilities of being a, a mom, uh, daily when a grandparent comes to me and, and are brokenhearted over their grandchildren, daily when I'm faced with these problems and people are saying, Randy, help me fix it. Randy, what do I do? How do I overcome this? I am constantly reminded that I can't do it. I'm, I'm constantly reminded that I am not designed or equipped to handle all the stuff that comes at me. Maybe you're like Barbara and you're in an office where, where, where things are not going well and people are constantly coming to you saying, what do I do? How do I handle this? What do I do with this? Do I look at my phone like Daniel's doing right now or do I actually engage in life? How do I handle the things? And, and I don't know about you, maybe, just maybe, you are constantly reminded like me that we are not equipped to handle the stuff. And that leads us to the truth. And the truth is this. The burden of me, myself, and I will get the best of us if we let it. The burden of me, myself, and I will get the best of us if we let it. Far too many of you remind me of Martha in Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 41. It said, The Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you worry and fuss about a lot of things. There's only one thing you need. Now, what was happening there? Martha was getting upset. Martha was getting frustrated. Martha was getting aggravated at all the things. She was overwhelmed at all the responsibilities of her life. And Jesus basically said to her, he said, now, honey, you're getting upset and you're getting frustrated about things that are above your pay grade. You're getting mad. You're getting frustrated about things that are too big for you. And you just need to focus on one thing. You're saying, well, Randy, I'm Martha. I've got a Martha heart. What's the one thing that I need to focus on? If I'm going to be set free from the burden of me, myself, and I, what's the one thing that I need to focus on? Well, read with me, if you would, in Matthew chapter 11, beginning with verse 28. It says this, Jesus, then Jesus said, come to me, underline that word me, if you're sure, Bible, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Uh, I don't know about you, but that's good news. But here's the thing. How do we unpack that? How do we make that a reality? How do we, we get rid of the heavy burdens that are overwhelming us and start carrying the burdens that Jesus wants us to do? How do we get to that place in our lives where our burdens are easy, our, our loads are light? Well, to see, the first thing we need to do, if, that, if you want to be free from me, myself, and I, the first thing we need to do is we need to let Jesus set us free from our exhaustion. We need to let Jesus set us free from our exhaustion. 
Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary. Wow, it's like Jesus has been hanging out in our house. It's like Jesus has been following me around. It's like Jesus has been watching me. And he knows just how tired, he knows just how weary each of us are. You know what Jesus is saying to those of you? If you're saying, Randy, I'm worn out, I'm weary, I'm bone tired. The old timers used to say that, I'm just bone tired. You know what Jesus would say to you if you were saying that today? He would say, come back, return to me, let me help you. You're saying, Randy, why would he say that? Why would Jesus' response to me saying I'm weary, why would Jesus' response to me saying when I, I'm tired, why would he, his response be to come back, return? Why would he say that? Because of this fact. The fact is this. Poor choices take us away from God's presence and power. Poor choices take us away from God's presence and power. For example, many of us, we, we've gotten to where you've listened to, this, to people standing on this pulpit, and you've listened, and you wake up, and the first thing you do is you start praying. You're like, oh, Jesus, I need you. If you don't help me, I'm sunk. Help me, help me, help me, help me. I, I, I've, I, I've heard you give testimony to that. That's the first thing many of you do during the day. But then you get out of bed, and you start making choices. And whereas you started the day smack dab in the middle of God's presence, you started the day refreshed and renewed by His power, you start making choices, and it starts taking you away further and further and further and further away from God. So by the end of the day, you are exhausted. Why? Because your choices have taken you away from God. We see it in Numbers 14, 41, and 42. Uh, Moses says, why are you disobeying the Lord's command? Your plans won't work. Don't go. Underline that phrase, don't go. Don't go. You will be defeated by your enemies because... Because the Lord is not with you. That's what Jesus is saying to many of us today. Don't go. Don't leave my presence. Don't leave my power. Stop making the decisions throughout your day that take you away from him. You're saying, how do you know that? Because guess what? You do realize the first 10 chapters of Numbers, the children of Israel were close to God. They were tight with God. They were like you in the morning whenever you're praying in your bed before you get up. And they were close, but they made sinful choices that removed them from God's presence. They made choices that removed them from God's protection. I think about prayerlessness. You know, many of us will say, hey, you know what? I start the day in prayer. I'll say my prayers right at the beginning. But at, throughout the day, it'll be three or four o'clock, and you're like, whoa, I haven't prayed since this morning. You do realize that prayerlessness is sinful independence. Prayerlessness is you saying, I don't need God. And our sinful independence that manifests itself through prayerlessness robs us of God's power. Oh, please remember, if you're weary today, please remember, a lot of our tiredness is the result of our disobedience. A lot of our tiredness is the result of our disobedience. Jeremiah 45, 3 says, I am so miserable. The Lord has added grief to my pain. I'm worn out. I can't find any rest. What's he saying there? He's saying he'd made choices. And those poor choices had led to his exhaustion. And so that leads us to the truth. That leads us to the hope. And the hope is this. We must surrender control to God in order to experience true rest. We've got to surrender control to God if we want to experience true rest. Psalm 35, 37, 5 says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust Him and He will act. If you were ever wondering, by the way, where the phrase, let go and let God, comes from, it comes from Psalm 37, 5. And when he says that, what he's saying is that when we let go and we let God, what are we doing? We're doing two things. We're freeing ourselves from the burden of whatever we're facing, but we're also releasing God, the God that made this universe, the God that made it all. We're releasing him to act on our behalf. For example, I don't know if you get this, but, you know, back when I was just a dumb old youth minister, I slept well. I slept like a baby all the time i go to bed, i go to sleep. But then I became a pastor. And then I became a pastor of a church. And then I became the president of the LAC. And then I became the pastor of two churches. And then a pastor of three churches. And I don't know about you, but man, I've, I'll lay down and everything will be good. Everything will be peaceful. My home's peaceful. And all of a sudden, my brain starts working. And I'm restless and I'm sleepless and I can't go to sleep. You know what I've had to learn to do? I've started praying this. God, release me from my cares. Release me from my concerns. Whatever I'm facing, whatever I'm dwelling on, whatever I'm thinking about, God, set me free 
from that. You're saying, Randy, why would you do that? Because, Randy, you need to worry about it. Randy, you're holy. You're spiritual. You're smart. You need to worry about it. Let me explain to you why I give it to God. Psalm 121.2 says this, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Underline that word maker. You know why you need to underline that word maker? Because I can't match that power. I, can't, I don't have that strength. When it comes to my, my foster kids, when it comes to my wife, when it comes to my daughters, when it comes to my son in Japan, I don't have the power to handle that. I don't have the power to handle your mess. I don't have the power to handle my mess. I need the power that created this universe to work in my life and work in my benefit. And so my question for you is this. Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Will you surrender control of your life to God? Why? Because if we want to be set free from me, myself, and I, if we want to set, be set free from the burdens of life, then we need to let Jesus set us free from our exhaustion. But we need, secondly, we need to be set free from our burdens. We need Jesus to set us free from our burdens. You're saying, Randy, what, what, what's different about that? Well, notice what Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says. Jesus says, come to me, all you who carry heavy burdens. Now, first of all, you, notice, do you see the heart of God there? You see, God hurts when Pete hurts. God struggles when we struggle. When your heart breaks, God hearts break. And this is what God is saying today. God is looking out over this pulpit. Uh, he's looking over this sanctuary, and he's seeing a whole bunch of weary people. He's seeing a whole bunch of people burdened down, and he's saying, oh, my goodness, I want to help them. Do me a favor. Right out beside tw- verse 28, he's talking to me. He's talking to us. Jesus looks into your heart and says, Come to me, all of you who are carrying heavy burdens. You're saying, Randy, I don't know if I'm carrying a heavy burden today. What do you mean by heavy burdens? What's he talking about there? Well, notice this fact. The fact is this. Our failures threaten to overwhelm us. The heavy burdens in our life are our failures that threaten to overwhelm us. You see, the Bible says each of us have these heavy burdens. And what is our heavy burdens? Right out beside that, that's the mistakes, the failure, the screw-ups, the stupid choices, the dumb choices, the things that you shouldn't have done that you did, the things that you should have done that you didn't. Our failures, those are the heavy burdens many of us are carrying around. Write this down on your sheet if you want to. Our burdens are the things from our past that we're still dragging with us today. You say, how do you know? Well, notice what Isaiah 59, 12 says. It says, we have done so many wrong things against our God. Our sins show us we are wrong. We know, underline that word no, we know we have turned against God. We know the evil things we have done. As you flip your notes over, what's he saying? He's saying, you know, for, for most of us, we don't have to be convinced that we're knuckleheads. Most of us don't have to be reminded that we're knuckleheads. We know we've messed up. We know that we've done wrong. But here's the problem. Our response to our failures, our response to messing up, our response to being wrong as a mother, our response to being wrong as a husband, our response is try to fix it ourselves. And trying to fix it ourselves is killing us. Some of you are saying, you know what, Randy? I get it. I've messed up. And I've spent the last 15 years of my life trying to fix what I messed up. Well, guess what? That's going to kill you. That's a heavy burden that you were not designed to carry. You see, what you've got to understand is that we were not designed to fix the mess-ups in our lives. It reminds me of Joshua. Joshua used to have, he, I don't know why, I always thought it was dumb, but he had this Thomas the Train. Y'all ever seen Thomas the Train? It's just dumb. I don't, I don't get it. But he had this Thomas the Train thing. And, and, and as boys are often known to do, uh, he decided to use Thomas the Train as a nuclear warhead to try to blow up some village, right? And so Thomas the Train was in four different pieces. Now, I'm sitting in my chair the whole time that he's doing it. It's just a plastic piece of junk that you probably, I probably got from McDonald's, right? I can put it back together for him, but no, 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 Josh, he got to fix it himself. i got to fix Thomas to train myself. And he spends about 10 or 15 minutes as, as a toddler trying to fix Thomas, trying to make it go back together. And the harder he hit it, the less it wanted to go back together. And finally, he just broke down and squalled. And he comes over to me with his hands and he says, fix it, Daddy, fix it. 
That's where many of you are today. How much longer are you going to try to fix it? When are you going to go to your Heavenly Father and ask Him to fix it? Because can I share with you some good news? It's found in this truth. God wants to use our overwhelmed feelings to drive us to Him. God wants to use our overwhelmed feelings to drive us to Him. We see in 2 Corinthians 1, 8, 9, he says, We had great burdens there that were beyond our own strength. We even gave up hope. But this happened so that we would not trust in ourselves, but God. What was, you see what he's doing there? He's saying, I want to use your hopelessness. I want to use your despair. I want to use your frustration. I want to use all of that to drive you to the foot of the cross. I want to use that to drive you to your knees in prayer. I want to use all of that to get you to depend upon him. I think of Joshua some more. You can tell he's been on my mind lately. What you might not know is that when Joshua was in his mama's belly, uh, we were told by the doctors that we lost him. She was having an ultrasound. The heartbeat was there. Next thing we know, the heartbeat wasn't. And she had lost a tremendous amount of blood. And so we were told on a Friday that we had lost Joshua. And they told us to come back Monday. They're going to do the DNC, whatever they call it, where they go in and they take out all the junk. But so we spent the weekend thinking we lost our kid. But I still had hope because until we knew, I was going to hope. And I still remember that Sunday. It was the first time in my adult life. I don't know about you, but when I was younger, I was too cool to go to the altar. I didn't bow down for nobody. I don't care how good a preacher you are. I don't care who you are. I don't bow down. I'm Randy Hand. But you know what? I was even in a church that didn't like people bowing down. But I ran to the altar. And I cried out to God. And I said, oh God, please fix my boy. You know what he did there? As you can tell, he's still alive. He's in Japan getting ready to go knock on North Korea's front door. He established a pattern of dependence with Joshua that's still there today. God used my overwhelmness. He used my hopelessness. He used my despair to cause me to be dependent upon him. And that put me right smack dab where he wanted me to be. And so my question for you is this. Are you overwhelmed today? Are you hopeless? Are you overcome Will you let those feelings drive you to Jesus? Why? Because we need Jesus to set us free from our exhaustions. We need Jesus to set us free from our burdens. But you know what? We also need Jesus to set us free from our yokes. We need Jesus to set us free from our yokes. Jesus says in Matthew 11, uh, verse 30, he says, My yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Say, Randy, what do you mean by yoke? Well, write this out. I just gave you the definition. Your yoke is our responsibilities in life, our responsibilities in life. I put out beside mine, because you know I fill out my notes just like I'm asking you to fill out yours. I put out beside that uh, the have-tos of life. These are the have-tos, the things that you have to do if, in order to, to, to live life. And God gave me this last night after we'd already done all the slides and everything like that. You might want to write it down. I found that there's three yokes in life. There's three kinds of yokes in life. You can write this down. You don't have to. I don't care. But the first kind of yoke is from God. That's what Jesus is talking about there. So the first kind of yoke is from God. The have to, the responsibility is from God. The second kind of yoke is our own. It's my yoke. It's what I put on myself. It's the responsibilities I place on me. But then I found out, you know, God showed me last night, there's, that there's also yokes from other people. Some of you are still living under the yoke of your parents, and you're 40 freaking years old. And what are you doing? You're living under the have-tos, the responsibility, the job description of your parents. Even though God has tried to set you free, you're still in bondage. And notice what Jesus says about his yoke. The yoke he wants you to have. His responsibility, his job description for our time here on earth is easy. Underline that word easy. It's light. But you know what? I've noticed something very disturbing. And this is the key. I hope you hear me. I found this, this fact to be very disturbing. The fact is this. We like to try to take God's job and ignore our own. We like to try to take God's job, his yoke, and we try to ignore our own. That's why Galatians 6, 5, it, it says, 
Each person must be responsible for themselves. He's saying, stop trying to be God. Stop trying to act like you're God. Take responsibility for yourself. Take the yoke that he has for you. Why? Because Isaiah 14, 13 said this. You said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. You're saying, Randy, what's happening there? He's saying that each day when we try to live our life by our rules, each day when we try to live our life by our responsibilities, our have-tos, you know what he's saying? He's saying that we are climbing up and we're trying to make ourselves God. We are ascending. We're saying, you know what? I'm better than God. I'm bigger than God. And I'm going to set me up an idol of me. I think of it all the time with this church. Y'all don't realize how easy it is for me to try to be God of this church. I got people all the time trying to make me their savior, make me their, fix me, Randy, fix me. And God has to constantly remind me that I am not responsible for you. You get that, right? You're God's. God owns you. You're his. He created you. You're his responsibility. I am not responsible for you, but I am responsible to you. My job is to encourage you to live by God's word. My job is to speak the truth in love. And I have to constantly fight when somebody comes to me for counseling. I have to constantly fight when somebody comes to me for advice to not try to be their Jesus. You're saying, why not? Everybody needs a little bit of Jesus. Let me explain something to you. I'm not equipped to be Jesus in your life. And some of you mamas, you're trying to be Jesus to your children. Some of you sisters, you're trying to be Jesus to your siblings. Some of you fathers, you're trying to be Jesus, and you're trying to act like God, and God's like, that ain't your job description. That's beyond your pay grade. You're saying, well, Randy, what do we do? How do I know if I'm doing that? How do I know if I'm playing God? Randy, how do I know if I'm doing what you're talking about? I don't want to play God. I don't want to play Jesus. Well, notice this truth. The truth is this. If what we're doing is not easy or light, then it's not from God. If what we're doing is not easy or light, then it is not from God. You're saying, Randy, what do you mean? I, I remember my first church. My first church, man, they, they, they brought me in. They said, Randy, this church is dying. This church is, it used to run 500. Now we're doing good to run 150. And Randy, we need you to save this church. Well, I, you know what? I was so prideful. I was so cocky. I was like, all right, big boy, I'll save this church. I can do it. And after about six months... I was already losing my hair, but about 80% of it fell out. After about six months, my stomach hurt all the time. After six months, when I'd go to give blood, my blood pressure was whoosh. Why? I wasn't carrying God's yoke from me. I wasn't carrying God's burden from me. I was carrying my own. I was trying to be Jesus. And I had a, such a blessed deacon that came to me and said, Randy... If what you're doing for this church is not easy or light, then it's not from God. Same thing is true for you. Can I get, look at what 1 John 5, 3 says. 1 John 5, 3 says, Loving God means keeping His commandment, and His commandments are not, underline that word, not, His commandments are not burdensome. What's he saying? He's saying again what Jesus is saying. Hey, the, what I want Keith to do, that burden is light. What I want Keith to do, that, that yoke is easy. And so if you get to the end of your day and your burden has not been easy, your burden has not been light, you need to start looking where you got off the wrong path. You're saying, Randy, I don't know if I believe that. Well, you know what? We need to deal with a big lie. There's, there's a lie that God revealed to me this week that has infected Freedom Family Church. This is a lie that has infected every other church that I've been a part of. This is a lie that has affected our culture. And here's the big lie. We need to deal with it. The big lie is this. It's a burden to be good. It's a burden to be good. How many times have I said, how many times have I heard you say, man, it's hard to, to be a good Christian. Man, it's hard to live for the Lord. It's hard to do this. It's hard to do right. But Jesus says, and 1 John 5 says, that no, 
It's not burdensome. No, it's not hard to be good. No, how do we know that? Well, notice what Ephesians 3.16 says. By the way, notice all the 3.16s in the Bible. They're pretty good. But Ephesians 3.16 says this, I pray that from God's glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his Holy Spirit. What's he saying there? He's saying that as a Christian, I've got God's unlimited resources inside of me. As a Christian, I've got the Holy Spirit of God living inside of me. As a Christian... God will empower me, enable me, strengthen me, and help me be good. And if I've got that inside of me, then guess what? You're right. It ain't hard. If you're, you know what? It is easy to live for the Lord. Why? Because I have the Spirit of God strengthening me and empowering me to do just that. You're saying, but Randy, I don't, I don't agree with that. I, being good, is that's just bondage. Being good, that's just, I feel like I'm in prison. Well, then you're not being good the way God wants you to be because Psalm 119.45 says, I will walk in freedom. For I have devoted myself to your rules. You know, one of the things I love is that God constantly surrounds me with new Christians. We're leading people. I got a text this morning about a girl listened to our video for a couple weeks ago, and she thought she was saved, and and she got saved, and hallelujah, praise the Lord. And I love it when new Christians come to our prayer times. It's funny that Andrew felt need to bring that up, because this past Tuesday night we were having prayer time. And, and, and I encourage new Christians to come because, you know what, baby Christians can pray, babies talk, so we can talk to God, so I encourage new Christians to come. And I had this new, uh, newer Christian sitting beside me, we were all in a group and we were praying. And I had talked that night about submitting. I had talked that night about the importance of submitting. And we talked about how it was important to submit in our families and it's important to submit at work. We were talking about submission, right? And submission is one of those four-letter words that's not four letters, but, you know, we don't like it, right? We're not supposed to say it, and you're definitely not supposed to say it in church. But we were talking about it, and we were praying about it. And so I prayed, and, boy, I just prayed some awesome prayer. I'm just going to tell you, I knocked it out apart. And then it was her turn. She was right here. She's a new wife. And she's a new mom. And this is what she said. She said, God, I thank you that it's so easy for me to submit. I looked at her like, are you on crack? Because there's a lot of words I use to describe submission. Easy ain't one of them, right? And so I was like, oh, gosh, she's in the flesh. She's, uh, I got I to gotta, I gotta rebuke that demonic spirit because that woman is crazy if she thinks submitting to her husband, because I know her husband, he is not easy to live with. But you know what? Afterwards, God's like, Psh! sorry, slap me upside the head. I was like, God, go slap her upside the head. He goes, no, I'm slapping you. Why? Because, see, this, she's just a baby Christian. And I taught her to kill her flesh and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so she just asked God to fill her with the Holy Spirit. And if she's filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what? It is easy to submit. It is. It's only hard when we're in the flesh. It's only hard when we're in rebellion. Submission is easy. It ain't that hard. And I spent the rest of the week going, man, I've just missed it. I believe the big lie that it's hard to be good. It's hard to do what God says. No, it's not. You're saying, Randy, how do you know? I, God reminded me of this, and I'm going to say something here, and I know you're going to be surprised. It may upset some of you. But give me a chance to finish, okay? I want to give you a real-life confirmation that, that being good is not a burden. Look at the real-life confirmation on the sheet. People who live right look younger than sinners in the long run. People who live right look younger than sinners in the long run. You say, I don't know if I like that. You saying I'm old? Mm-hmm. Okay, we're just going to leave that there. No, how about this? This is where I learned it. When I went to college, and I went to a Christian school, I went to a, well, not Christian, Baptist. It was different. There's a difference. I noticed that guys that I went into freshman year with, right, that uh, they, were, they were on the party plan, all right? I was on the religion track. They were on the party track, right? And so they figured Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that was for party, and Sunday was for rest. They did get that right, right? And I noticed that my, my, my junior year, these guys, their, their hair looked all dry and brittle. Their face was all, you know, wrinkly, and they looked like they were 40, and they were a sophomore in college. And I asked my brother about that. <laughs> Ray says, they're partiers, Randy. You ever heard the phrase, Ray, road hard and put up wet? I said, yeah. He said, that's them. 
And so here's my question for you. If sinning is so easy, if sinning is not a burden, then why does it age us so much? I'm here to tell you, you've been lied to. It's not a burden to be good. It's not a burden to follow God. His word says what? Loving God means keeping His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. You've been lied to. I've been lied to. We've been lied to. And so my question for you is this. Is your yoke easy and light? Will you stop trying to be God and only do what He wants you to do, not what you want to do? In fact, let's talk to the Lord about it right now. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Again, this this whole message was born of heartbreak. It was born of the heartbreak of you and me going through life carrying burdens that we were never designed to carry, taking responsibility for things that we were never supposed to be responsible for. And so I've got a simple question for some of you. Are you sick and tired of carrying the load of your sin with a capital S? You saying, what do you mean, Randy? Well, the Bible teaches that each of us was born with a sin, with a capital S, nature. And that sin causes us to want to do bad. That sin causes us naturally to do bad. We don't have to work at being bad. It comes natural to us because why? It's, it's our nature. And that sin nature is a burden. It is a burden to carry. And maybe the reason why some of you came today is because you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And, and you know that there's something fundamentally wrong with you. You know that things are not what they should be. And it goes back to you carrying a burden that you were not designed to carry. You see, you were designed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You were designed to make God look good. You were designed to love Him and to love others. And here's the good news of getting saved. Jason did a great job of talking about that today. And one of the great perks of getting saved is the Bible says that when we cry out to God, He comes in and He kills that sin nature within us, and He gives us a new heart. He gives us a new life that wants to do good. And so, guess what? You may have walked in here all burdened down by sin with a capital S, but you can walk out of here a new man, a new woman. You can walk out of here free. You do understand Christianity is fundamentally an inside, interior heart job. And if your heart has not been changed, then you are not saved. But today you can be. Today you can have a moment. By the way, this is not... Like other moments, this is your moment. This is your time. This is your opportunity to, to cry out to God and say, God, I'm, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of carrying this burden of sin. Lord, I'm sick and tired of carrying my failures. Lord, I'm sick and tired. Will you kill the old me and give me a new me? That can be you today. You're saying, well, Randy, I don't know how to talk to God. I don't know how to ask Him for that. You talk so much better than me. I don't know about that. But this is what I'm going to do. In just a few seconds, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. If you'll pray this prayer with me, then you can get a new heart. You can get a new life. You can be set free. You're saying, Randy, do I have to pray it out loud? Yeah, I want you to. But this is what I'm going to do to help you. There are going to be people all around you. They're going to be praying this prayer out loud. And it's there to help you do what you need to do anyway. That's our job here at church. Our job is to encourage you. So would you pray with me? Would you just pray, Dear Jesus... I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Savior and Lord. And Jesus, help me to live for you. It's in your name I pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer with me, then guess what? You have been forgiven. You have been given a new heart. A new life. God's killed that old you. By the way, that may explain why some of you have been miserable lately because you prayed that prayer with me a couple of weeks ago and and you're still trying to act like the same old knucklehead that you used to be and and you're not going to be happy doing that anymore. You're saying, well, Randy, what do I need to do now? You need to tell somebody. Tell somebody that you came with. Tell somebody that cares about you. Tell somebody that's willing to have a spiritual conversation with you. You know that they care enough to love you. But tell somebody before you go to sleep tonight. Let me pray for you. Dear God, thank you so much 
for your salvation. Thank you so much for your freedom. Thank you, Lord God, for removing the burden of my sin and anybody else that prayed that prayer with me today. Lord, be with us. Help us to have the excitement, the joy, the, 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 the pure joy to share with others what you've done in our heart and lives today. It's in your name I ask. Amen.